So given that a lot of their background has an emphasis on morality, there's a lot of good that you can draw from somebody who's coming from a LDS background. Uh, what are some of the blind spots that you think that they may have coming from that type of faith? Well, theologically, it's just insanity. I mean, for us, as, I don't mean that in an insulting way. I just mean that when you look at the ancient faith and that Christ is truly God and the understanding of the Holy Trinity and the creation of the world. And, you know, we say Christian, you know, there's a lot of differences between Orthodoxy and Catholicism and being a Methodist, whatever it is, but at least you could gather those people and say that Christ is fully God and fully man. And, you know, God created everything out of nothing and these kind of basic Christian tenets. So we Mormons are not Christians in this way. And they're very offended if they hear that. And I explained to them, I know you call yourselves Christians and you love Christ, who you seem to be, but Christ is not God to them. So they're not Christians in the proper sense in the world. And so it's totally unlike us in that way. There's no um, ultimate connection in that way. So that's a huge difference we have to be honest about. Like there's a, I think there's an assumption of vocabulary. Use the word sacrament. For them, it's water and this, and it's a symbol, right? Somewhat similar to a Protestant understanding, way different. Uh, the idea of ordination, the idea of priesthood. Every Mormon young man, you know, takes on the ironic er priesthood, right? He, every Mormon man is a priesthood. Maybe older becomes a Melchizedek in priesthood and the bishopric and all this. So they, just because of their cultural awareness, it's all they know. It's, it's like growing up in Mexico and everyone's Catholic, right? Everyone kind of knows what Padre is and who this kind of is, and they wouldn't have a context for anything else. That's how it is there. So they, the new terms, new things are very hard. They say the church. You know, Orthodox Christians, we say the church says this, the church says that. They say that because they have a heavy idea of the church, which, by the way, I should say is a beautiful thing because when they find orthodoxy, unlike, I think, like radically individualistic evangelicals or Protestants, LDS people make the best Orthodox Christians. Really, the best because they're humble. Like, like they love to, like, where can I tithe? Like I naturally tithe. What can I give to the church? Where can I sacrifice? How can I help? What can I give? They're naturally obedient to something greater than themselves. It's a natural humility and service. That's not like, that's different than Protestants. Very different. And they're very obedient and they love and they respect the priesthood. And it's very beautiful, actually. But in terms of blind spots would be, um, again, just they're very unaware of anything outside of their own religious upbringing. Like they don't even know what a priest really is. Um, they don't know like what Holy Communion is, the idea of the saints. I mean, they're all saints, right? They're called Latter-day Saints. It's a very funny name in Spanish. I think it's the, how do you say, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Last Days, de las Ultimas Dias. It sounds a little more ominous when you say it in other languages, like this is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, of the Church of the Saints of the Last Days, you know? But that, in other words, they're all kind of saints. And for us, we would say that's really lowering the bar. Like we're called to be saints. Right, so that, I think also that idea of asceticism that's present in, no, it's not present in, in Mormonism. Um, they're, they're very moralistic. Like we're moral too, we should be moral. But for us, morality is just the outside. Like we don't, Dostoevsky says, just to, you can't just do good for the sake of doing good. If God doesn't exist, then everything's permitted, right? So they're very moralistic, which can lead to a lot, I think a lot of pride, generally speaking. So like being holy, like I remember I asked two Mormon missionaries that came to my house, what's holiness? You know, take it in the, tra take it in the trash cans for your neighbors and do it. I said, no, that's, that's being virtuous and doing, what's holiness? I described the life of St. John Maximovich or something and they had just no context. Or I bring them into the church and they sense the incense and like just the feeling in an Orthodox church. I said, do you feel that? I'm not like a frou-frou, like, do you sense that presence? And they go, we never experienced anything like this. So for them, Holiness is not really, they're not even aware of that. That could be a blind spot. They're very moral. You know, check the box off. I think it's a big temptation. Check the box off. Be moral. Make sure you do this. So it can be about externals in many ways. And I'd say one of the other big problems is that it's very um, emotional. There's a high sentimentality. And uh, almost like some of my friends who are Pentecostals. It's very much like, I feel that. Because there's, there's an innate trust of the heart. Right? Like, I have a burning in my bosom. This is a famous kind of phrase from, you know, from Joseph Smith, etc. Like, you, you, the way you discern if something's true is if you have a burning in your bosom. You know, I'll give you an example. I gave a talk once to some LDS uh, chaplains, I think it was, who were chaining at BYU. And I gave a talk about orthodoxy. And it was nice and nice conversation. But at the end, somebody said, oh, I could really, you know, I could really feel the spirit of what you were saying. And so from an orthodox perspective, I'm just like, Ugh! like, like, I don't want to like emotionally manipulate you. I want the truth to say itself, right? But there, there's very much a sense of like, 
I can feel it. And what they'll do with door to door, they'll, and I remember that asking about Joseph Smith and Book of Mormon trying to convert you and uh, they circle around the pamphlet. They don't want to have a real conversation. I'll have a real conversation with them when they don't come around much anymore. But uh, they, I said, how do you know this is true? In the search for truth. And we talk and I'd say, they'd say, I just know in my heart it's true. If you just meditate in your heart and you get that thing, you'll, do you feel that Joseph Smith is a prophet? And I was like, no, no, no. That's, you're pulling me to this subjective place where I can't follow you. Let's talk about objective. Like, I tell them, I have a friend who's an atheist. He's a Jewish guy, a Jewish atheist. And he says, I'm not an Orthodox Christian. But if I was, I'm not Christian at all. But if I believed in God and went to church, I would only be Orthodox. He says, because it's not a burning in the bosom feeling. It's not my warm fuzzy versus yours. The Orthodoxy is the true church. You should pray about it, you know, come on. It's just objective history that an atheist could tell you that the Orthodox Church, you can trace it back. There's apostolic succession. People don't know history. Mormons don't know history. Not like many Protestants don't know history, too, about the history of the church and the church fathers. They all kind of believe in an apostasy, which when they learn that's not true. It's a, they don't know that's a big blind spot, we might say, but this set of mentality can overrule your reason. And as you and I were discussing earlier, reason has a place, the mind of Christ. It can take you to the base of the mountain. But then you have to, like, then your heart, and by heart, I don't mean flaky emotions, I mean the center of a person through prayer and asceticism takes, that's where you meet God. But our mind has a place to search history and to read, read about things and do these things. And, and I said, you know, well, I just know my heart's right. And I said, why is your heart a trustworthy barometer for truth? Why is that? I just know you can't tell me. I said, what does Jesus say is in the heart of a man? Another blind spot for LDS people is they don't know the Bible very well. For them, it's more authoritative other books like the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. Just, this is more authoritative for them than the scriptures. That's problematic, right, for obvious reasons. And so they don't know the Gospels very well. I mean, some, there's exceptions. Generally speaking, they don't know the Gospels. Say, what does Jesus say is in the heart of a man? When you tell them, I don't know, they say, they say lies, deceits. Remember how Jesus says, and he knew it was in their hearts. So our hearts are junk in the fall before they're pure. Bless the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And until your heart's purified, you should trust the people that have done it, the saints. This is all new to them. They were just like, what? The idea that you wouldn't just go with the feeling and your warm fuzzy in your tummy and you wouldn't, that's shocking to them. And I can tell you an interesting story that I was at BYU giving a talk and there was a man, you know, he was from South America and a convert to Mormonism, raised in the Spanish-speaking family and uh, like a like lapsed Catholic. And, uh, you know, LDS Church went down there. They're good. Like, they have, they have great missionaries in every language. They do their thing. They're kind of miserable in South America, and they can come up to Utah and, you know, go to school. And his, his wife was there, too. And they knocked on the door, you know, tell him this. Do you believe in your heart? Do you feel this in your heart? And, yeah, yeah, I feel it in my heart. So, anyway, long story short, <laughs> South America to Utah, where it's freezing and everything. And, and the man started praying recently and said, he never asked this question, is there truth outside of Mormonism? And he got the same warm feeling. And he went, darn, what's, what's going on with the barometer here? What's... And, then he, and then he was watching like a Disney movie, which is, that's a funny thing, but as a college student. But, and he goes, I was watching The Lion King or something funny. He goes, and I had the same warm feeling. And he started to weep in front of me. He says, I based my whole life around this, what I thought was this totally, you know, it's kind of this... <laughs> barometer of truth that's infallible and I realized it was just my feelings and I've been taking note I mean so emotion manipulation see what I mean there's no sobriety of spirit that you see in orthodoxy um, in Mormonism I think that's a that's a big blind spot and I think they have people who are leaving Mormonism or are skeptical I think this is something beautiful for orthodoxy for them because you, your faith shouldn't be rooted on this because this is flaky today I want Chinese food tomorrow I want Mexican food I mean our faith has to be rooted on something deep, both intellectually, historically, but also ascetical life. So that's shocking to them, but also comforting to them as they come into orthodoxy. That, and a lot of LDS people are, who are thinking of believing, or the ones that already have left, they feel like they've been duped sometimes. They feel like they've been duped into thinking their heart, right? So they're very untrusting of the church and of this, and they appreciate the sobriety of orthodoxy. Don't just tell me you're one fuzzy. Like, show me history. Show me... So that's interesting. So that is actually what's a weakness for them is what's appealing to orthodoxy for them in many ways. When you're speaking to LDS that are open 
to exploring orthodoxy, maybe they're even catechumens. What are some of the things that you're having to see that they unlearn some of these habits that are just so ingrained in them that they have to unlearn? We've talked a lot about the positives and some of the weaknesses, but what are some of those habits that you think that, you know, the, the paradigm shift that they need to uh, experience? Well, I think unlearning is important for all of us, right? And some people who come to me, they say, I was raised nothing. I was raised nothing. There's a, more and more, there's a lot of people like that, raised nothing in America. Um, they think they're at a disadvantage, and I tell them, you know, God knows wherever we're coming from. He's calling everyone. And maybe in some ways it's easier. I said, what do you mean? I said, you don't have a lot to unlearn. I mean, sin, of course, we have to unlearn in habits of passions and sins. But um, you're right, there's, there's a sense in every background has these unlearning and baggage. And it definitely is the case, I mean, in LDS Church, because not only is it your faith, it's your culture, it's everything. Um, I would say that the unlearning has a lot to do with, with how do we pray. I mean, most LDS people kind of pray, unless they're really disciplined, um, kind of like Protestants pray, which is whenever they, the Spirit moves them. Which an Orthodox Christian would say, if you wait till the Spirit moves, you might never pray again. Right? There's a sense that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force with asceticism and this idea that we pray with her, no matter how we're feeling, because we love God. I mean, I have 10 kids, change the diaper whether you want to or not, because that's love. So if we love God, we get up out of bed and fight to pray no matter what. That's foreign to them, again, because, you know, I mean, there's exceptions to that. But generally speaking, um, it's very moralistic, as I mentioned before, and the idea of we have to go deeper. It's not just like learn the moral code, do the externals, like the whole idea of orthodoxy in the ancient churches, the kingdom of heaven's within you. And that whole process of going deep is so new is so new. And by deep, again, not like this, the deep heart, right? The center of a man, like in the news, not just this kind of flaky emotionalism or just intellectualism. So I think that's new for them, but they want it. Um, I think also just, you know, temple worship for LDS people is a little more mysterious and it's an interesting thing. Um, but day-to-day -day worship for, you know, LDS people at the ward building is kind of, it has a Protestant feel, if you know the, the difference, and um, it's not very, there's not a sense of mystery. It's casual, they're sitting in pews, they're, you know, they're dressed nice. That's one thing, LDS people know how to dress to church. When they come, they dress nicely, they wear their Sunday best, which I, I do think is important, actually. Um, they're not coming like in sweats and a t-shirt or shorts, and like they would just, they would never do that, by the way, which they have a sense of honor and reverence. But, you know, the incense and the reverence and is almost uncomfortable to them, and to many Americans, I think, because we're overly casual. But they're unique because they are religious people, but it's, even the worship is it's very casual. So the seriousness and the, and the, whole, and the, the awe and, the, and the, the carefulness with which we serve the liturgy and we, and we stand and cross ourselves and do this, I think that's shocking to them at first and a little scary, you know, at first of um, these kind of things. And see, one thing with LDS people is even though their history, I mean, they were like very other, right? You know, then like Utah couldn't become a state because of everything. And so there, so I think that unfortunately there was a thing that said they're supposed to be a peculiar people. That's one of their prophets said, a peculiar people, hardly. They are the most, like they want to be the most American. You know, the biggest holidays in Utah are Halloween and 4th of July. I mean, Easter is just another day. It's, it's a family day and things. It's just for us, Easter is everything. Pascha is everything, right? So it's just so different. It's very kingdom of this world. There's definitely a prosperity gospel aspect to Mormonism. Like if you're a good person and do the right things, things are going to go well from you now and then in the next life. And this, it's very, it's uh, culturally, you know, to be successful, which I think is not what the gospel says, actually. And I think that they want to be validated as a people, maybe after years of being kind of, you know, um, not. So, you know, like they're the most, American is apple pie and, and they're not, they're normal. Up until like years ago, they didn't call themselves Christians. That wasn't until they were really losing people in the 80s and 90s. And there was those commercials when I was a kid in New York, Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, kind of marketed themselves more as Christians. So the desire to fit in. Like Mormons are like the best looking people, trendy, everything. You know, like it's like the women are beautiful, the men are handsome. It's, so I think that's, there's something about the being successful in a worldly way that is really important to them. And I think that orthodoxy, of course, the ancient church came the whole world and lose your soul. Or St. Catherine, who was a knockout beautiful, but Jesus said, you're ugly to me because of her soul. That's shocking to them at first. And the idea that they have to shed that, I think, is difficult. And I think that that's a unlearning. 
that has to happen. It's not about checking boxes off or just being a good person. Jesus didn't come to make us good boys and good girls. He came to transform us from the very middle, from the very center of ourselves. And that's shocking to them. It's inspiring to them. They want it, but it's a whole, like, it's a whole other mentality to them, if that, if that makes sense. So, yeah, it's a lot of unlearning, I would say. Um, I mean, I guess if you're Catholic or if you're Protestant or if you're nothing or you're Muslim, a baptized Muslim, we all have this to some level. Um, I think they do have it, but I think that the things about orthodoxy that appeal to them and where they're at are, are stronger, thank God, such that they can fight through it. Does that make sense? You know, like, for instance, you know, I think that Mormons have a dynamic view of the next life. Again, even though it's very skewed and not Christian, they have this idea that we continue to grow and that growth never ends. Like Saint Gregory, the saints talk about this, how you know, a parabolic line grows to another line, to infinity, it doesn't touch it. So the saints, our holiness and God and theosis, God willing, you know, and that continues forever in the next life. We never, creator and creation never come together, whereas they believe falsely that, that you become creator, you become a God. I mean, it's, it's a whole other conversation, but they have at least a sense that heaven is dynamic. Whereas I think they might look at Protestantism and even the way the Protestants kind of try to proselytize them is terrible. Like holding up their temple garments and in protest and, then, and putting them in. Like if you're an LDS person, you go, that's a Christian. No thanks. When they see the humility and the love of Orthodox and the beauty of Orthodox and the knowledge of Orthodox. And I think, I think a lot of people think heaven's going to just be like rolling around with puppies. And, and I mean, I hope it's as good as that. And, then, and we're going to be you know, holding hands and it's just like, oh. And like, it's just this static we're here now, whereas when you read the church father speaking about the kingdom of heaven, and it's a constant dynamic growth that has no end. I mean, it's so spectacularly beautiful, right? And C.S. Lewis talks about that in the last battle, further up and further in, and one world became a whole other world, and this continuous growth, that's very appealing to an LDS person who knows their faith, that orthodoxy has an understanding of that. And it's not just like, oh, you're baptized, you're saved now, what are you doing? Go save other people. There's a sense of a, a dynamic growth into the likeness of God. Because they, they like this idea of theosis. They steal St. Athanasius, the great. God became man so that man can become God. But we mean God's by adoption, right? Saying great, everything that God is by nature, we're called to become by grace, what the saint says. But they believe that you become by nature, like, which is, of course, complete heresy. And they're, not, they're not even Christians in that way. But the fact that that's appealing to them they see that orthodoxy cares about that, that we are called to be like God and to grow into like, and so I think that's an appeal that's very strong and that they feel like it's not just static and join the club, that there's a, uh, in this life, but also in eternity, there's a continual growth in Christ.